Now let's move on. Remember that children need a lot of repetition to remember concepts. We saw that yesterday perfectly. Um, youth need repetition as well, but maybe not as much. Uh, think about the newscasts um, where they talk about something, what, this is what we're going to see, and then they do it, and then they talk about, well, this is what we just did, kind of idea, so, which is more of what we do as adults. Use questions uh, for ch children that are geared to the more obvious and concrete answers. Okay, you were asking me about critical thinking. Mm -hmm. This is how you do it. Okay. It's asking questions. So, for children that are geared to more obvious and concrete answers. So, you know, little kids, you, you, can't, you can't be, you can't always say why. You, you ask them why and they'll make up something hilarious. <laughs> it's kind of fun to do that, that's fine. Um, but you can use it as teaching as well. Uh, questions for youth can be, begin to go much deeper and ask the why questions. So I have a continuum of questions. Who, who is in this text? What's going on? When do you think this happened? That's a more historical background, so you know that's more youth. You know, how did how did people feel? How did the how did the Pharisees feel in this passage? How did Jesus feel? How do you think Jesus felt? How do you think the disciples felt? that kind of thing. And so what you're doing is you're actually teaching them to observe and interpret. Sound familiar? <laughs> observe and interpret. <laughs> and then you can go into what, what does that, like, I did a teaching, let's see, on Philemon I do this a lot. I'll focus on the who's. Okay, let's look at Philemon. Who was he? Well, he was the person that this letter was written to. Uh, what do we see in the text about him? Well, he had a church in his house. So what does that mean about him? Well, he might be a leader because he has a church in his house. Okay. He's also maybe wealthy because all, all the people are coming to his church and it's big or his house, which must be big enough that he has all these people. So you can see I'm making deductions. I'm kind of interpreting in there. Uh, then I go into Paul. Okay, who's Paul? Paul's the writer of this letter. He's, we know he's an apostle, okay? What does he say in the letter? He's talking about Onesimus, who's this guy that was Philemon knew, okay? So we talk about Philemon, sorry, Paul, asking Philemon to do something. What is he asking him to do? So, and I usually kind of go through what did Onesimus might have done, because we, we can see that in the text. Okay, so what is he asking him to do? Forgive him, as he would for be for if Paul was there, <laughs> and that Paul was going to take his offenses upon himself. Okay, and then what is, so, and Paul is considered a leader of Philemon, if we can see from the text. I'm sorry, I'm just doing this over the top of my head with many, many years of doing this. But anyway, and then Onesimus. Onesimus looks like he was a former slave. He was a servant of Philemon, okay? And something happened to him. What happened to him? What does Paul say? Paul says he was formerly useless, which was his name, and now he's useful because he's become my child in my imprisonment. Did Paul get married and have a kid? No, so that was probably a statement of that he became a Christian, that, it's, that he became saved. All right, okay, so he, he became a Christian with Paul. Okay, cool, so he, when he did that, now he felt that he, Paul needed him to go back and have restitution. Okay, what do we learn? What do we learn from Philemon? He, he is receiving um, Onesimus, maybe. We don't know for sure. We know that there was an, an, an Onesimus that became a bishop. So it's a possibility that he was received and forgiven. What do we learn from Paul as a leader? Family. 
family. Tell me more about that. He considered him a brother. He considered him a brother. Philemon was a brother. Onesimus was a brother. Yeah, they're both brothers. So it was the family of God. Okay. What is Paul's value of bringing Onesimus back to Philemon? Restoration. Restoration. So as a leader, we need to help people. So I can learn as a leader that I need to help people bring restitution. And Onesimus, what do we learn from Onesimus when we do something wrong? Make it right. Make it right. So do you see what what I'm doing? I started with who are they, what are they in the text, then I moved into uh, some of the maybes, I call them the maybes, interpretation, the maybes, and then I moved into application, what we can learn from them. That is really high level basic, but it's very effective. And I gave, I fed a lot to you, but you can actually wait and have your, your youth. And I think you can do this with little kids too. I really do. It's, you're helping them along the way. So I actually love doing this. It's fun. It's like one of my favorite things to do. So, yay! You just had a lesson on inductive teaching. (laughs) Okay, so it says, don't be rigid, but be aware little children won't usually know the more in-depth questions of why, but they, that doesn't mean they can't, you can't teach them the why. You can, you can kind of help them with the why. All right? And this is, to me, this is actually helping them teach critical thinking. To think what, or who, what, how, why, when, if they're is appropriate. Questions? I'm teaching them to, to listen to the Holy Spirit. Yes. In that sense, if they come up with something very really insightful, mm-hmm. encouraging them. Yes. Wow, that was kind of Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Pats them on the back. Helps them. Yes. How would you, I think, for me, and I, can, I know for you, a lot of our times talking with youth, it's not really teaching, it's preaching. Mm-hmm. It's us speaking at youth groups, it's us speaking at youth events, stuff like that. <laughs> How would you apply, because it seems like children, it's more like, oh, this is teaching, it's more involved. Mm-hmm. With youth, it's a little bit more preaching. How would you kind of take those, those kind of concepts of, of questions and games and kind of open that up, would you, would, would you kind of suggest going back to kind of what Phil suggested mm-hmm. and mixing it? Um, or would you say, like, still ask the questions, but pose it as more of, like, a, yeah, just, like, don't expect like, an answer, just have to the set of it. Yeah, well, just to, to, you can have a group of a thousand people, and you use that uh, tag, teaching, yeah, and you will be teaching to a thousand people. You are asking the question, you're posing the question, you're giving them time to reflect, and then you give the answer from the stage. Yeah. And so you, you, there could be people that will be shouting things out, but you don't necessarily have them to respond, you just need them to, to process what they're thinking. And, and, and do it. So as you, I think with that kind of approach to it, with the who, what, when, how, and why, is that you're posing the question, that you do the dramatic pause, and then you proceed to answer, and that way you are doing a teaching without necessarily having them, the thousand people, all respond to it. But you can still do things like, like you can do the object. You can still do music. Yeah. You can still do visuals. Yeah. You can still actually. Uh, they say stories are kinesthetic because uh, you are getting into the feeling and the gut of it. Remember, we said it's gut kinesthetic you have a gut feelings so you the stories are considered can be considered that so where children you want to get them up and acting and doing all kinds of stuff so all right good good discussion use games to bring focus or change direction or to get them more engaged for children you can do big motor skills or simple bible games simple 
questions. Youth icebreakers. They have lots of icebreakers that you can use. Word games or more complex Bible games uh, or Bible questions and whatever. But those are not, this is not exhaustive. This is just off the top of my head. So does that help? Kind of gives you a little bit more to run with. Okay, concentration. Levels are affected by our culture and society norms. In the US, the concentration time for children is very short, possibly 30 seconds to 20 minutes. Two minutes. <laughs> I mean two minutes, yes. Sorry, I'm looking at the next one. Concentration time for youth may be more like one to 20 minutes. Concentration of adults is not much better. We try to work on having just 45 to 50 minutes for teachings before a break. In other countries, audiences can sit for two to three hours as they are oral learning communities. I didn't put learning, but that's what they are. When there was a significant change in our history that for the concentration when the TV came in and it became blurps and it's changed our society's way of concentration. So the concentration levels went down. The internet and social media have decreased this even more. If you go to, like you do see like Instagram, I'll look, I'll be on Instagram and somebody will have done a video like of some person or whatever and they're just like all these different, it's just and I, I don't even look at them anymore because I'm like, I don't want my concentration level to go down. <laughs> so, but anyway, so that's kind of what's going on, so. It's nuts. It is crazy different. Even TV shows, like compared, I saw this thing comparing like old Star Trek to new Star Trek. Movies and like, oh, really? They have like these full conversations in old Star Trek, and they're like, <laughs> there's like dialogue and stuff, and a new one that like just evolved into like fight scenes. Yep. And it's it's crazy. Like, yeah. Compared to basically the same movies. Yeah. Ag actually, you can see that in books too. Like reading, I don't know, Lord of the Rings. Lord, reading Lord of the Rings and how they develop the characters and they develop the world, you know, and then you look at some of the newer ones and it's like they immediately go into, it, it, like, it's not interesting unless it's pulled you in really quickly and you go into some sort of crazy, and that's what they tell writers too. You got to grab them and do this thing where, here, here's Lord of the Rings, you know, <laughs> here's Frodo, Getting a ride with Gandalf. <laughs> like like yes, exactly. <laughs> it's hilarious. It's like so different. So yes, even in writing, it's changed big time. All right, moving on. Never assume. This is the never assume part. Never, and this is not exhaustive either. We could probably add to it. Never assume that everyone in your audience knows what you are talking about. Be aware of acronyms and idioms, all right? Uh, YWAMers are some of the worst. <laughs> yes, we, we will get up and we will, well, I, I don't know how many times I've been a part of a group of people and there's several people who are not from YWAM and they're like, oh yeah, and SBS, we're doing this and then the DTS is doing that and then and I'm like, School of Biblical Studies, nine month school, DTS, Discipleship Training School, our initials <laughs> So I'm like in the background trying to help them figure out what we're talking about. <laughs> we have to worry, just the whole thing. Yeah, that's I just, exactly. And that's what I do. I say that's the old thing. Like even if I've talked to them before, yeah. it's probably been six months or a yeah. year, so I don't remember. Yeah. What you guess in. Totally. I, I was, I noticed that when I talk in front of people in a group of like non-Western or definitely not American, and I, I end up using idioms more. It's like they just drop out, and I'm thinking, what am I doing? I cannot do that. Um, 
So that's something to be aware of uh, because people don't know idioms. And actually, idioms are really interesting because every culture has their own idioms. Some of them kind of are similar, but not, not a lot of them aren't. And so be really careful about your idioms. Uh, try not to use them at all. I would just say don't use them at all unless you're explaining them, like they're using them to explain something. Uh, please be careful not to assume that children have both their parents or are with their biological parents or other family members. Uh, big one, I've done, I've made that mistake and felt really bad. <laughs> Please don't assume children feel loved by their family members. That's a big one. Watch them carefully for their own safety, like when that I'm talking about. If you do notice that there is a something that's not right about their family and when they talk about like when we talk about family then you know something just to be careful because you want to make sure they're safe please do not assume they know people in the Bible or scripture verses unless they were with you you were with them and taught them about it so this is what happened to me when I was a little kid and I felt very humiliated um, please do not assume children know how to read. All right, so there's, it's big. It's a big one. So they might be having problems and you don't want to. So th obviously this is just kind of a high level. There's, there's so many more. Can you guys think of anything else not to assume? Not to assume they're a Christian. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Bible stories is a big one. A lot of people think that it's like, oh, they know that Jesus is the Son of God. Oh, they know that Mary is his mom. Everybody knows Jonah. Everybody knows Moses, Noah, David and Goliath. Yeah. David and Goliath. They just, they just don't. Yep. It was, a study came out that it was like 40% of people under the age of 18 don't know that Jesus' last name is in Christ. <laughs> Yes. And that was like in 2019. <laughs> right, right, right. And so it was some study like that that I was like, well, oh, if they don't know that, then they definitely yeah. don't assume they know the actual story, let alone the implications of that story. Right. So you just can't quote it with, without saying it. Totally. Absolutely.